for the stream to start. Wow. Look at this. So now you can just send Antonuka link to that instead, which might be easier. Yeah. Can you? I'm going to send this to you. I'll test it. Uh, an email. Oh, yeah. Yeah, me too. Hi, Darren. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. 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 Oh, hi, how are you? Good. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. Oh, it's it's an honor. Uh, just kind of trying to keep things moving in the right direction. Yeah. How long have you known the family for and stuff? Well, this is your dad. Wow, wow. Yeah, I'm going to get this thing going here. That, that we're doing a little live stream for people that can't be here. So, works okay. Oh, we <laughs> this woman just said she recognizes her basket. It would okay if we borrow it for like letters and cards. I'll see if they want to buy it from you, or maybe in exchange for the violin. <laughs> Is that okay though? Um, how do I? Oh, it even like it even does audio then. It's live those happenings. So crazy. I'll do that. Oh, that's my hand. 
Say that again, Ruth. It doesn't like it. able to um uh i'm going to turn on the audio to make sure that you're hearing it or can you can you hear it too oh good okay great for life
Hi. Um, Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes, when, when I start the service, I'll make sure the camera is positioned well on uh, the people who are uh, speaking. Yeah, but if, yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Your kids, your kids are here. Oh, there we go. You got it. To me, to me, thanks, guys. So, Nancy, right. people are watching. Are they watching right now? They're watching right now. <laughs> so, we actually are streaming it on YouTube. Okay. I'm not sure if there's anybody else that you wanted to link, but it is going to be there. With and if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them And then you ask them. Yeah, sir. Sure. See you in So it's a bit of a delay. See how, oh, yeah. see how like, yeah. I try to pin this here. Don't watch. I'm trying to figure this thing out here. 
That's fine. <laughs> So if you look at it, it's about a 30 second delay. Okay. Whereas Google Meet is actually, I don't know why I can't get your screen large, but anyway, you know that that one is large. That's our video. So yeah. That's cool. Okay. Cool technology. Um, okay. And then you guys are leaving tomorrow? Or? Hi, Ruth. Hey, hi. I'm doing this one on uh, on Google. On the other one you had. Who is it? I'm going to figure this out. Says watching too. Oh, good. Yeah, but at least she has her camera turned off. And it's also on YouTube. So we'll see. Uh, I should let them know. Yeah. I should let them know. The better it's going to turn out. We see your parents here. Hello. Yeah, you, I don't know that we can hear you guys, but hold on. They can hear us fine, but I think yeah. I muted them. Yeah, so. I know. But no, it's great. I'm on YouTube. I've never been on YouTube, I don't think. Of course, you need. We're not going to. This is on Google Meet. It's like Zoom, but it's uh, 
it's designed for it's a long have like unlimited time. And then if you go over to YouTube, it's a little bit delayed. So it's like a one minute delay. Oh, sorry, Mama. Oh, that's really funny. There, you can see now. Right? Although, for them to like sit the street. All right, that's the route. Oh, that's good. Oh, oh, man. You guys, it's an honor. Hi, Hi, Ruth. Ruth. I've got my, I've got my um, sound on. Now. I shouldn't have it on. It's distracting. For them, it's distracting. Friends, we invite you to find a seat as we uh, get started here in about a minute. Wow, no one ever listens to me that well, but it's impressive. Yeah. 
Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, measures before we begin today. Uh, how many of you have never been to the Winfield Memorial Hall before by a show of hands? Wow. I just found out this was built in 1910. 1910, just a little bit before Uncle Hank was built. Um, but uh, I think they used to have outhouses back then, but we do have in-houses now. We have washrooms and they're just out that door there. So if you do need a washroom at any time, um, it'll be out that door. Um, and so, and then afterwards, we really don't want you to run away or to drive away. We'd love you to stick around and share some food with us. Uh, share some conversations, some stories, some words of encouragement. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a uh, computer open with a live stream for a grand total of, I think, three people, uh, which is really great. It's Hank's older sister, Ruth, and her husband, Mo, are in Port Alberni. And so they're able to join us on live stream. And I think Lisa's joining us from Red Deer. So we may break the internet with this one today. So uh, so that's gonna be great. Thank you for joining us today as we have come together uh, to remember and to honor Hendrik Hank Peninga as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as a friend, as a coworker, as a great citizen of this community for many years. So my name is Mike Peninga and I carry the same last name as Hank but I am from a different branch of that family tree. Uh, growing up, whenever per people heard that my name was Mike Peninga, probably three times out of four, they would say, are you related to that meat Peninga in Winfield? And I would say to them, no, that is my uncle, uh, but I am happy to say that we are related. And so today as a nephew, I am the son of Ernie Peninga, Hank's younger brother, uh as a nephew and as a fan of hank as someone who has enjoyed him over the years i'm honored to help facilitate uh this gathering and it's important that we gather i was a pastor for 18 years at uh two churches in Kelowna, and oftentimes when someone lost a loved one they would come to me and say my loved one did not want us to make a big deal about them they didn't want to have a gathering or a memorial or a free funeral. And I would say to those people what I'm saying to you today, this isn't about them. This is about you having a chance to remember them. This is not about putting them on a pedestal and telling untruths after they're gone. This is about, this is about us coming together and remembering the impact and the influence that Hank had on our life. This is for Cheryl, and this is for Hank's kids, my cousins, Gary and Keith and Leanne. It's for his grandkids who are here, Eric and Emily and Jessica and Eva and Reese. It's for Hank's sister, Ruth, and brother-in-law, Mo, watching from Port Alberni. It's for Hank's sister-in-law and my mom, Ruth. Yes, at one time there were two Ruth Penangas. Super confusing. It's for us cousins, and it's actually pretty special that today there are nine cousins from this branch together today, and I hope we can get a photo from youngest to oldest at one point. I have brought den denim shirts for all of you so we can match lovely a little bit later on. So today is a chance for us to remember, to celebrate, to honor, to share stories, and you may find yourself laughing, that's appropriate, you may find yourself crying, that's appropriate. You may be reminded of a story that had long since been forgotten today, and that's good too. Uh, we're gonna say goodbye, and it's not gonna be stuffy or formal because that was the antithesis of Hank Penanga. It's uh, Hank's style to be simple and unfiltered. Is that fair to say? <laughs> so the one who was responsible to keep the two Penanga brothers in line growing up was his their older sister, Ruth, that's my aunt. She's watching from Port Alberni. And uh, Ruth has written a eulogy that her daughter, my cousin Janine, is gonna read in just a moment. Tell us a bit about Hank's life. 
And there will be a quiz later on, so please do take detailed notes about this. And then we're going to have a chance to hear from Hank's kids. And all of them said to me, you know, Mike, we're not public speakers. And I said, that's good. Just tell us about your dad. And so we're going to just have them come up and tell us a bit about their dad. And then we're going to have a time, uh, the family has asked for an open microphone time. That always instills a little bit of fear in me as an MC. Give the microphone to people who might think that we're here to hear every one of their stories, which is not true. We would like you to come, though, prepared to share maybe a memory, a story, a reason that Hank had a positive influence on your life. And so if that's you, we'll have space and time for that as well. And I'll close with a few final words before we enjoy some refreshments. Uh, thank you, Sharon and John and ladies for what you've prepared for us. And uh, to be in this space is, uh, is pretty special. We are so glad that you've come. It is important that you are here. It is not just for you that you are here, it is for others. It is for the family to see the impact and the influence and the ripple effect of their husband and their dad and their grandfather. And so today, as part of our grieving and saying goodbye, we are going to lean in. And I'm going to ask Janine to join me up front here at this time. And uh, she's going to begin by sharing this eulogy written by Janine's mom, by Hank's older sister, Ruth. And so thank you, Janine, for this. We have one fan that sounds. I don't think we could be in a 120-year-old hall without a fan just like that. That's amazing. So. Yep. I'm Janine, for those of you who don't know me, and um, I'm one of Uncle Hank's nieces, one of two. and. It's a privilege to be here and to speak some words that were written by my mother, Uncle Hank's sister. And so some of you might know her, uh, Ruth Wilhelmina Peninga. I look a little bit like her. I sound a little bit like her. I move a little bit like her. And so if you close your eyes, she might just be here. You never know. So I know she's watching and um, she's written a few words that She's asked me to read on her behalf, and so I'd like to do that now. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ruth Wilhelmina Peninga Umran, sister of Hendrik, a.k.a. Hank Peninga, not to be confused with my sister-in-law, Ruth F. Peninga, whose husband, Ernie, was our younger brother and who just passed away last year. Hank was well known as the famous butcher of Winfield Meats and later Hank's custom cutting and wrapping. His younger brother, too, Ernie, was an equally famous butcher, cutter, and wrapper. And these two men were the sons of another well-known butcher, Garrett Peninga, of the Rutland Meat Market. Do any of you remember the Rutland Meat Market? Oh, there's a couple out there. Anyway, we all started our lives here in the Kelowna area, there in the store in April of 1958, after having immigrated at the end of January 1952 from Holland. Ernie had been born there in our dad's homeland, whereas Hank and I were born in Germany, close to mother's family. Hank was born on July 2nd, 1946, but he was a preemie and he needed extra warmth even though it was summer. As I'm sure you can believe, there were no available incubators at that post-war time. So legend has it that he was placed in an open oven on very low, of course. <laughs> I don't know if it was that experience or simply just genetics, 
But our dear Hank was a very special guy from the very beginning. Whereas Ernie and I, we were sweet, obedient kind of kids who could be easily controlled by a look or a pinch to the gluteal, max, to the gluteal muscle from our dad. But Hank was definitely not. No, he was high-spirited, strong-willed, and determined to get or do what he wanted, no matter what the cost. And cost him it did, quite often, in fact. But he'd take it with a smile and he'd keep on going. And he did, right up until the very end. Maybe he took after his namesake, our grandfathers, Hendrik Peninga in Holland. By the way, we have many Hendricks and Hanks in the family, and that's because the oldest son in Dutch families were named after their grandfathers. We also have a cousin in Smithers by the name of Henry, the English variant of Hendrik who is with us here today. Can I see where he, oh, right up front. There we are, perfect. Grandfather Hendrik was apparently a fine, calm character who once caught hold of a mouse running up his pant leg to right about here and simply remarked, that's enough now. <laughs> That story puts a big smile on my face, because that took guts, wouldn't you say? My brother Hank was that kind of guy. Gutsy and with a smile. As has already been noted by many of you in your condolences on Castanet. Hank was truly a fun-loving, hard-working, happy-go-lucky fella. Yes. Sure, he could be a bit loud and abrasively straightforward, but hey, at his core, he was very soft and with a heart of gold, the kind of guy that you'd give the shirt off your back to. Back in the day, some 51 years ago, when I came home from Germany at Christmas in 1972, I came home to tell my family that I was probably going to marry Mohammed Amran. My brother Hank's memorable line was, What? An Arab? You couldn't find anyone else in all of Europe or Canada to marry other than an Arab? Because he was also the one when Mo and I and our three kids, Janine, Najee, and me, immigrated to Canada in 1980, who built us a house in the backyard of Winfield Meats, just to be ready, should we need a home. As it was, we were put up in mom and dad's basement for six months until we could move into our duplex on Benchview Road in Rutland. We didn't end up needing that specialty built home, but that was Hank. Always actively ready to help. Mo and I moved to Toronto the following year in order for Mo to regain what he was in Germany before coming to Canada. But we eventually ended up in Calgary and then in Port Alberni. Hank and Ernie faithfully visited us in both places. And Hank often brought mom along too on those long eight hour trips. Mo and I truly appreciated my two little brothers and their families. We were very close. Sometimes we called ourselves the Three Musketeers. Seeing as we had survived the same immigrant experience together, 
and the many moves our parents had to go through before finally settling in at Rutland Meat Market. It was those first five and a half years and the church hopping moves that followed that defined who we were and who we became. It was in Rutland Meat Market that my brothers learned their trade from a master with a diploma in everything meat related. That was our dad. Dad didn't hold much with schooling. A trade was more important, he felt, especially one that was guaranteed always to be in demand. And hey, after all, people always have to eat, he'd say. So the fact that by this time, Hank was intimately acquainted with the principal's office for certain classroom behaviors, well, that gave dad a good cause to take him out of school at the end of grade eight. Neither the principal nor Hank minded, and dad put him straight to work in the world of deboning, chopping, and grinding hamburger, as well as stuffing and smoking sausages and hams. Ernie was also introduced to those life skills the following year as he finished grade nine, whether he liked it or not. He often regretted not being able to finish school, but he ended up doing so on his own later and to his credit. Meanwhile, I often wondered and was amazed at how hard my brothers were working. As I'd see their dark ringed eyes and pale skin, their tired yawns every day, while I happily went my merry, merry way off to school, something just didn't add up. It wasn't until years later that I heard the true cause. <coughs> Hank, being a very social, daredevil type, would climb out of his and Ernie's bedroom window, with Ernie right behind, of course, and take off for a night of fun and games with their friends. Often they'd make it back home when the light in the workshop below was on, which meant dad was already at work at around 3 a.m. And they'd somehow sneak back in and get under the covers and catch a few wakes or, to, or pretend to be sound asleep as mom came up the stairs to wake them at 6 a.m. Hank was also the mastermind behind the souped up go-karts that used to outrun the police on Rutland Road and Highway 33. Some of you remember. He'd do so by driving through the open repair bay at the corner of the Esso station that used to be there, and then right through the alley to our place. Our parents were woken up by the police on more than one occasion to ask about or to inform them of Hank's whereabouts. Hank had a certain notoriety, even though we were definitely brought up to be good, God-fearing citizens. Well, we had family devotions every morning from 6 to 7 a.m., and we went to Sunday school and we always attended church, even twice on Sundays. Plus, we went to any midweek meetings. Having fun and adventure was just part of Hank's DNA. It cost him dearly at times, but he'd simply admit it was his own fault and carry on with a big smile. Like the year he spent many months in a body cast after crashing his first car, all the while repairing it in his every free moment out behind the garage. Oh, he was very mechanically gifted. He managed to put that little black car together again 
and then using it and the money he'd saved, bought himself a big cherry red Parisienne at around age 18. He, of course, needed to try it out, and as usual the case, he took Ernie along for the ride out through the back roads of Glenmore. Well, they must have hit quite a speed because suddenly, so the story went, a telephone pole came towards them out of nowhere and hit them head on. Ernie's glasses were later found with their frames stuck into the hilt of the back seat, but Ernie himself remained in the front, although on the floor and at an odd angle, beside a calm and still and upright Hank. Miraculously, neither of them were seriously hurt, apart from Ernie having a broken arm. Naturally, of course, Hank had a story ready for the police when they came. Really, officer, we were trying to miss hitting a dog that had suddenly crossed the road. Did I forget to mention the car was a total write-off? Did you know that Hank also loved boats? He had a boat at a relatively early age. And he used to love taking a bunch of his friends out for a ride on Okanagan Lake, speeding under the bridge and so on, until on one such occasion, the boat was accidentally cut in half. But thankfully, without any loss of life or limb. At the tender age of 19, Hank got married to Karen. In fairly short order, they had Gary, Keith, and Leanne. A bit earlier, Hank had decided that he needed better pay, and he had quit his job and confidently walked across the street to a job that he had lined up at the new hardware store, which had just opened that Monday morning. But by noon, he was back. Having quit the new job, as he felt it to be a bit too boring, Dad graciously took him back. Once a married man, he decided it was time to open his own business. And what better place than Winfield? He was in his early 20s, and Dad had already retired from and sold Rutland meat market due to health reasons. So Hank got dad to come and help him just to give dad something to do. Well, you know what I mean. <coughs> and yes, dad enjoyed it too. Ah, uh, yes. Those were the days of that bull standing on the top of the shop's roof along Highway 97. Do you remember it? Oh, yes, I do. I think we all do. Ernie, meanwhile, together with Herman Venden Ehrenbeamt, who had also initially worked for Dad, started up their own meat business called Bonanza. Much later, if I'm not mistaken, Hank was done with Winfield Meats and tried working at Bonanza, but found it just wasn't for him. He liked being his own boss. So on moving to Langcourt, he built and opened his own custom cutting shop in the back. Some of you have been there to that place. That all went well. Only until his next door neighbor's complaints became quite personal. And then following a uh, <clears throat> suspicious fire, Hank was forced to find a new location for his shop. That is where many of you remember him from, working last. 
across Highway 97 from where Leadhead Road becomes Enterprise. He and his loyal longtime employee, <coughs> right hand gal, Sharon Fuchuk, here, here, we talked, enjoyed serving customers there for many years, right up until he retired. Hank was so good at what he did. He was. Many of you have pointed that out. He's an excellent butcher and a wonderful human being. He certainly was. He made friends easily and loved people, hailing them with a big smile and a loud greeting whenever he saw someone he knew. That's what he called me. Or, hi, Mo. Whereas Ernie and I tended to be introverts who avoided drawing attention to ourselves. But Hank, Hank was that big hearted, loud and friendly extrovert. Hank was also a loving and doting dad who took his kids everywhere. He took them California camping to Disneyland and then for ex extended summer holidays to the Fintry and he got them a swimming pool and whatever toys and games that their hearts desired. Well, at least that's how it looked like to my kids <laughs> whenever we would come to visit my brother's place. Yes, it was a much looked forward to event. <clears throat> my family appreciated going to see Hank and his family because we lived so far away from them. We rarely got to come to the Okanagan to see them, as well as my other Ernie, as well as my other brother, brother Ernie and his family, and their three children, Martin, Michael, and Melody. My close relationship with my brothers and their families was the main reason that Mo and I moved to Kelowna when I finally got Mo to retire in 2009. We loved spending time with both my brothers and reminiscing about the good old days. But as we all got older, it was time to slow down. And eventually, even Hank had to slow down. Unfortunately, Ill, Ill health was part of that for Hank, but that didn't stop him. He now had a new hobby, train spotting. Do you remember this? <laughs> he and Cheryl and the dog would venture forth in his pickup truck and spend whole weekends watching those magical metal monsters maneuvering around the bends of the rails. Hank loved filming the trains and also photographing them. He had an amazing memory and a mind for details and a great love for the trains. In fact, he knew them by name and number and often posted pictures and stories about them on the internet. Perhaps some of you have read or seen his feeds on the internet. He made even more new friends around the world this way. He and Cheryl also love to travel, mainly to Hawaii, but they also went to the Dominican Republic, among other places. Hank, Ernie, and Ruth, my sister-in-law, and Mo and I went for a trip to Germany and Holland to revisit our roots in April of 2012. It was the week after our dear mom passed away. Oh, don't worry. She had wanted us to go ahead with our plans prior to her passing, and we had a great time being together us three musketeers. Hank 
was a lot like mom. She loved being with people and telling them detailed stories about her adventures. She also loved the outdoors and sports and animals too, just like Hank did. Now, of course, Ernie and I know that you don't have favorites when it comes to your kids. But Ernie and I felt that when visiting mom, it seemed like a visit from Hank counted for two of ours. Besides, as he got older, Hank looked just like our dad, kind of like Keith now. And that reminded mom of him. His big smile, his booming voice, and his matter-of-fact style that never failed to cheer her up. Maybe that's why Ernie and I used to hear mom call Hank a man and a half. <laughs> After retiring, Hank needed some work to keep him busy and to keep him in touch with his social contacts. In contrast to his brother, Ernie, who had retired years earlier due to health reasons and who had volunteered for years already at the KGH parking lot. Hank took another job with budget, driving and returning loaned vehicles to where they had to go. He enjoyed it. In fact, he was still speaking of getting back to work when we visited him after being in the hospital about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> yes, he was optimistic right to the very end. He was full of love for life, for his family and his wife, Cheryl. Cheryl, he always gave credit to you for looking after him so very, very well. And especially in that last journey, those final months. We will all greatly miss him. But because we know that Hank was a believer in his savior, we know that we will see each other again in that place where there will be no more sighing, no more crying, and no more death. Hank, we look forward to seeing you there. And now if we can just close our eyes for one minute for mom's last words. We thank you, God, for all that Hank has meant to each one of us here. He was a unique and definitely a one-of-a-kind guy. God, you give us all so many gifts, and we give you all thanks. We ask you to bless Hank's family with a deep faith like his, and grant each of them your peace as they move forward in his memory and leave with his legacy now as theirs. Amen. Thank you so much, Janine. Uh, you are a fantastic story reader. And Angie Ruth, you are a fantastic story writer. Uh, I uh, appreciate all that you have shared. And just so that you can see everyone who has gathered here today, would you just give a second to wave here, friends, at uh, uh, Ruth and Mo in uh, Port Alberni. It's very special. Um, I'm gonna ask Gary and Keith and Leanne, my cousins, Hank's kids, to come up at this time together. And uh, so if you guys want to like to stand up from your seats and move towards me, then that's going to be great. Uh, there was um, a lot of good stories shared about Hank and my dad, Ernie. Dad was the younger one. One story I always remember, these were guys that were given knives way too young in life. And I think Hank would have my dad like lie down 
and he would practice throwing the knives like around my dad. And am I wrong? There was one that stuck in at one point. Did that happen? It happened. All right. So there is a bit of a uh, bit of sadness about that moment. So, um, so we're gonna hear from Gary as the oldest, and then Keith and Leanne. So thank you so much. Maybe just stand over here so that they can see you there. Of course. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, from you know the perspective of the firstborn, you know, uh, growing up uh, with with Hank in the in the meat shop, um, you know, all I have memories of is of the meat shop and just being around it. Uh, I'd be, I'd be in the meat shop as a little rug rat, um, you know, and and when when you know our age group was growing up, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have anything. All we were was was oh thank you. All we were were just boys, you know, trying to keep busy, have fun, but uh, be exposed to you know the, the 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 adults. And for me, it was you know my dad and and the uncles. So there'd be Ernie, um, you know Bob Eckhart, um, Uncle Kirk. You know these are the the figures that would be around the meat shop. And and uh, as a, as a kid, it'd be it'd be you know kind of fascinating just seeing them in the meat shop. You know working hard, and they're there to work. So I'd be in there, you know, bugging them. I'm having fun. They're working, and just you know, day after day, month after month, year after year. That that's what I would see, and you know, being exposed to that when you're when you're a kid, you just sort of you don't know anything other than that, and and being uh, being like the son, you know, I I was expected to work, and I didn't know any different. So uh, they 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 put me to work. You know, I'd be pastoring them, and you know, they just. You know what? What they would do is they'd, they'd stick me on a chair because I was only about this big. They'd stick me on a chair, and you know there'd be like you know a mountain of beef, and they'd you know there'd be a lot of meat talk here because obviously you know that's that's how I grew up. They'd, they'd take the beef necks out, and they'd do it really rough. They knew how to be around, and they'd stick me over in the corner on the chair to pick all the meat off. And Hank could give me you know two bucks or five bucks or something. So you know as as a kid. I was a rock star. I was money, right? so they did pay me, and and I thought it was great because because you know you looked up to these guys, and 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 when you grow up like that, you get sort of exposed to that work ethic, and and that is one thing that definitely you had to you had to kind of understand what Hank wanted because there was only one way to do things right, and that was his way, and over the years you see people. You know, people that needed the job come in, and if they didn't cut it, they'd be gone pretty quick. And then somebody else would come along, and the ones that would stay would be the ones that had that work ethic, and, and they'd be working hard. And it wasn't over at the end of the day; it was over when the work was done. And you know, that was the kind of person that Hank was. It'd be it'd be a team, and when your job was done, he'd come over and help you with yours, and he'd be the first one there and the last one out. And when when all the work was done, it was like a group effort and everybody was gone. So I mean, that was one thing that that definitely he prided himself on is that kind of a work ethic. Um, and as as a kid, it just seemed he was he was you know fearless, right? He did he'd do anything. He didn't hesitate. He wasn't procrastinating. If something needed to be done, he'd do it. You know, sometimes I don't think he put a lot of thought into how to go about it. He just started doing it, and and. You know, a lot of times, you know, he obviously pulled it off, but his his sort of awareness of risk and risk management was a little bit questionable at times. <laughs> and and you know, there's there's stories that you know some people here probably know about. One of them is you know the what Mike said the throwing of the knives. You know, that was that was that was a story that I caught on to fairly early. And the knife did stick into Hank's left knee, and he had a scar there. So you know. You know, when they're doing that, there's some questionable judgment going on. <laughs> and, you know, there's stories of, of Bernie and Hank in, um, in the, the Brother Meat Packers delivery van. Um, Ernie on top, surfing, then bombing down some road, getting to the destination, and then Hank realizes that Ernie's not on top anymore. <laughs> and turning around and going to find him, and he's crawling out of the ditch because he just regained consciousness, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, the, the 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 story of the knife, um, you know, being a daredevil. You know, if, if there was something kind of questionable to be done, it, it you know, get Hank to do it, he would. Um, 
he broke his back um, taking a ski jump on a toboggan. And I can only imagine the kind of air that he got. But he just, you know, again, he'd just shake it off and, you know, eventually he'll be, he'll be do something like that again. <laughs> um, there's a, a story, and, and Keith will remember this. We're in the, in the meat shop uh, in the back, one of the walk-in coolers. And the rails were on, on beams. And uh, at one time, after a bunch of years, some of them were kind of pulling up. So he had to do some renovations. He did all that himself. And uh, he, um, he had to take cut some of the rusty bolts off. So he had a, a chair, this chair that I was, and th by this time we were like 17 or something. This chair, the one that I would sit on or stand on when I was like eight. You know, he had that in the back um, cooler in an angler grinder. And in my memory, he's got a colt in his mouth, but I don't know if he did or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he's, he's upside down with an angle grinder. Whoever knows angle grinders, they, you know, they've got that sort of gyroscopic effect. So they're pretty sketchy. And he's upside down trying to cut off a bolt and he needs to put his foot on the wall to, 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 to kind of right himself. And Keith and I are watching this go on, looking at each other going, oh my God. And he pushes off to kind of reach this one that he couldn't quite reach. And the, the chair goes up on two legs. So the chair is on two legs. He's got his foot on the wall. We have an angle grinder upside down. And we just had to stop him, right? So get, spot, get down. And I remember him being annoyed at us for doing that because it was just like a few inches away. So we had to go get a ladder, bring it in there, let him kind of go about it. So we didn't see him cut his finger or horse. But uh, you know, that was the that was the kind of guy that he was. He just he just go ahead full force and do whatever needed to be done. Um, you know, uh, the, the 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 process of uh, you know losing a loved one hasn't happened often to me or something that's close to me, but when, when it does happen, and I'm sure everybody here has had that experience where, you know, things that happened in the past, you know, like you long forgot about, they recall, and over those days and weeks, you just keep recycling some of those, and, you know, eventually they, they come up and you, you remember some of those good memories that you've had growing up. Um, and with, uh, with, with Hank, you know, him and I were together a lot. We'd, um, we'd go driving in the bush because he did like to drive. Um, there were there were the years in Fintry where, and I don't remember when, when we'd start. Um, I, in my mind, I think it's like eight years old, might have been ten. But eventually, I had to go to work in the summer. So summer holidays, you know, was kind of over for me at a certain age, and I'd have to come with him to the shop, and he'd always be at Fintry uh, every day, and he'd drive back in the morning in the boat. To, the, to the, the, the marina, put the put the boat on the trailer, take it to work, work all day, go back and do it all over again. So that was like the Monday to Friday routine. And uh, for a while, it was me and him that were doing it. So that was another one of the things where you know, we're, we're going across the lake and we had to go to work. So it didn't matter what the weather was doing, right? We had to go. And um, eventually, you know, to be quick, you know, I was like, I want to say, but maybe I was 10. He'd park the boat, he'd go get the van, put it in the water, and eventually, you know, he'd let me take the boat and drive it up on, on, the, on the trailer. He'd hook it up and we'd be gone, and that was a routine. So you know, that, that's kind of stuff that, that he would do just because we had to work and I was exposed to that. So, you know, I, I, those are memories that, that, you know, I remember and that I appreciate. Um, the one thing that, that uh, I'd like to say about Hank is, and this is some of the things that you may may resonate with with everybody is is he was really forward and that's one of the things that i always kind of was fascinated with watching him when um when we were growing up is you know i was really shy and kind of off the side i didn't really like crowds or people but he was really, really forward and he knew everybody so i was always amazed that he knew everybody's name everybody and he'd meet people or not even meet people but he'd see people that he'd met like 20 years ago and, remember their first and last name and go up and, you know, introduce and shake their hand and I'd be watching and they wouldn't know at all. They wouldn't remember it, but he'd know, remember everything about their name and when they met and the last time they met. And that was one of the things that I, I thought was amazing. Um, but one of the, one of the, one of the, the, the attributes of, of Hank is, is just how forward he was and people were really comfortable with him. And um, growing up, there's, like I said, the, the, the grieving process with 
couple of the things when I was young, and I don't remember when he did it, but uh, one of the things he would tell me is, um, you know, when there's a when there's a dinner, you don't start eating until everybody's sat down with their plate, right? It's a respect. Um, and and also he he'd had some really gracious sort of behaviors where, you know, he you know cooking steaks. This is one. This it was it was it was a steak dinner, and and he's barbecuing up a big pile of steaks, and and handing them out. He always he'd always serve himself last, and everybody got a really good steak. And if there was one bad steak that was kind of, you know, kind of off, and I I know what he liked, and if there was one that wasn't, he'd keep that one for himself. And and that was one of the messages he gave me. And I don't know how old I was. It was it was if there isn't enough to go around, you do without, and everybody else gets their share. So you know that's an example of Hank and just the kind of gracious behavior he was and. And and you know one of the ways he approached people that sort of made him really endearing. That's really kind of my memories of Hank, and I think everybody kind of got that sense as well. I'm Keith. Everyone can recognize <laughs> my dad, me. I'd like to thank everyone for being here today to celebrate and honor the life of my dear old dad, especially the ones who traveled so far to get here. I want to thank John and Sharon Fuchuk for being such good and close friends to my dad and our family and for putting on this event today. I want to thank my cousin Mike for helping to organize and being the MC for this event. My respect and admiration for Mike has been multiplied by my witnessing his strength and leadership through his dad's passing and funeral. Finally, I want to thank Cheryl, my dad's loving partner, for giving him such good care in his last years. I'm here to express my gratitude and appreciation for the life my father gave his children. Materially, he gave us everything. We wanted for nothing. We were well off. We had motorbikes, we had a boat. We had a cabin in Fentry where we'd spend our summers riding our motorbikes and water skiing. He took us to Disneyland twice and he took us to Hawaii twice. But way more important than all that, all these things he gave of us, which actually made us who we are, principles and ethics he instilled in us. Nothing comes for free. He said this over and over. If you want something, you have to work for it. And having a meat shop, he was always happy to provide us an opportunity to do so. Second, if you're going to do a job, do it well. And when we didn't do a good job, he would take the time to show us how to do it better. Don't do something half-assed. Do something you can be proud of. He taught us to be frugal. He always repeated the words that his dad repeated to him. It's not what you make, it's what you spend. These words have always stuck with me and has made me what others call cheap, but I prefer the term frugal. He taught us not to be afraid of failure because it is from our mistakes that we learn to do better. Fortunately, some of these mistakes lead to physical injury, but I guess those are the ones you learn from most. Lastly, and most importantly, what he gave to us was a legacy. A legacy that came from a reputation that was attached to our name. A legacy which began with our grandfather, who started with nothing and built it over decades with the principles of honor and integrity in business. 
a legacy which further which was further built upon by his children and eventually inherited by us and one which i could not be more proud Why do I got to follow that? <laughs> we are here to celebrate my dad, Hank Penega. If you were in this town in the 80s, you know the Penega name was synonymous with his butcher shop. My brothers and I can attest to it being a good and a bad thing. Bad if you're trying to get away with something, but good if you want to bribe your friends with pepperoni. <laughs> I grew up the youngest and only daughter in a family of butchers. I embrace that role, even going so far as to spend my childhood days playing with cow eyeballs that my dad or my opa would give to me so that my bike could see. That story is so much a part of who I am that I even told it at a supervisor's conference as a fun fact about me. Being a part of the Penning family and legacy that my opa started so many years ago has been meaningful to me. Heck, I even married a butcher a butcher that got into this business because of my dad and my brothers. And he is very grateful and appreciative of that influence on his life and career. My father was an ambitious and determined. Even as a young man, he had a dream to march to his own drum. He branched out on his own and never looked back. As my cousin just said, he was a daredevil, loved adventure, worked hard, sacrificed a lot, but always had a sense of humor. His hearty laugh and little smiley faces that he would drive, draw on everything, we always associated with him. He was a leader and a stern boss, but he was my dad and he always had a soft spot for me. I am confident that my experience with him was very different than my brother's. Being the only girl in the family, I knew I was treated differently. I knew I was a daddy's girl and I knew I had a special relationship with him. But one thing I will say about him, he never tried to stop me from being me. Coming from a traditional European family, I'm sure some of the things I wore in the 80s were not what he had in mind for his daughter, nor when I wanted to be a welder briefly when I was 19. He didn't tell me I couldn't or shouldn't. He always believed I could do anything I put my mind to. He worked hard at everything he did. He gave my brothers and I a very good work ethic and showed us what it was to be proud of the work you did, not only at a job, but as a member of your community. He worked hard at having fun too. I will be eternally grateful for the time and effort he spent for us to have fun and experiences and memories. Those vacations and summers at Fentry will be forever in my memory. The weekend skiing and motorbiking I cherish now, especially because those times were mostly just him and I. He gave me that gift, the gift of happy memories. I've also tried to pass that on to my children, no matter what is going on or how much money we have. A cherished memory lasts forever. I will cherish the memory of my father's laugh. His big heart, his large hands that enveloped mine, his big smile. I love you, Dad. I will always be your little girl. Um, perfect tribute, perfect tribute from Gary, just perfect for you and the key. So proud of you, man. Did really good. You had notes. <laughs> you unfolded your notes. <laughs> Yes, you look like Hank and Garrett. We named my son Weston Garrett Peninga. Leanne, it's beautiful for your dad. Uh, the Peninga name means something pretty special, right? It's good. It's good when someone says your name and there's positive stuff with that. It's good. It's just thinking, I didn't have this in my notes. Um, I would love to find out, for those of you who are here, 
If you have known Hank since the 1970s or earlier, could you just stand up where you are right now if you've known Hank since the 1970s or earlier? Okay. Wow. Okay. That's a testimony. Now, if you've known him since the 1960s or earlier, stay standing for the 1960s or earlier. Okay. Now, do we have anybody here who's known this Peninga group since the 1950s? Stay standing. Wow. Really? 50s? Where do you guys know them from here? You probably have some good stories of them sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night. Oh. Wow. Are you guys all, you guys all live next door? Family. What's your last name? Sure. Back. Um, Ruthie, sister or Auntie Ruth, do you know the Sherbeck family? There they are. They were responsible for your brothers being bad. So, was there somebody else from the 50s that, that no, and your name again is? Your first name is? Joanne Salem was with you, Aunt Ruth, in your schooling in Rutland. Wow, cool, cool. Your name, sir? Oh, yeah. Okay, speaking of meat, Norm Doug. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else known them since the 50s? Yeah? What was Wasterdowski? I would have loved to have been able to walk into the Rutland Meat Market and see Garrett and Marie Feninga and the boys. It's pretty special. My wife and I, uh, Jeannie, we went to Halifax and we went to uh, Pier 21. Is that what it's called? Pier 21 is where all the immigrants landed. And in 1952, when my dad was four, I guess Hank would have been six. Is there two years between them? One year only? Ooh, sorry, Marie. Oh my. Uh, we went to the place where they landed on that boat from Holland uh, over to Canada. And um, we just both burst into tears because we imagined the difference of our life had that decision not been made by our OPA. And um, for an OPA who didn't necessarily believe in education, I look at the next generations and the next generations and the next generations. I look at that ripple effect. It's pretty amazing. This is an unexpected gift of today. It's just what we're sharing. Thank you for this. Um, it's two o'clock and uh, we don't have much left, but I did want to leave some space for some open microphone time. I said earlier, it's always nerve wracking because you don't know who's going to share. If Norm Duncan gets here, we're done. Right? You know? <laughs> but I think we would have some time if you would love to come up. And when you do come up, don't be shy. Just be like, my name is, and I knew Hank from, and one thing I appreciate, or one story that symbolizes this man, you would give a gift to the rest of us. You would. And so um, I'd love to take maybe 15 minutes for this open mic time. So if you're like, I've been thinking about this, I want to do this, leave your seat and come up here and I'll stand beside you. And if I gently put my hand on your shoulder, it just means that we'll wrap her up. <laughs> All right, so uh, if you are here today and you would like to give a gift to um, Gary, Keith, Leanne, Cheryl, those who gathered uh, by telling the story of impact and influence of Hank, just join me up front. And uh, the first person is always the most difficult, especially the way that I set this up, really making this tough for you, I know. But we do want to hear your story, just not 17 of them. So uh, make your way up to the front. Sharon, I'm going to put you on the spot to come on up too, because I think you know Hank quite a bit. She's like, no, I can't do it. Yes, I'd love you to. This is another Henry. So Henry, I'm going to love uh, let you share here, and you can wave at uh, Ruth and Mo over there too. Ruth and Mo. Yeah. Uh, I'm another Hendrick Penninga. We uh, live up in Smithers. We're named after the same grandfather. 
And uh, the thing I remember most about Hank coming up to Smithers one time, uh, it was hard for him to get away from his parents, but they let him come up and we were teenagers. And the first thing he did was uh, miss the bus in Prince George. And at that time, a fare, a bus fare was about $40 from Kelowna to Smithers. So he missed the bus and knowing Hank, he couldn't wait for anything, he grabbed a taxi. The taxi brought him to Vanderhoof, which is about a hundred kilometers down the road. It cost him 70 bucks, but he made it. And yet we did sneak out the window once in a while when I was in Rutland with the boys, but uh, it was a great time. And uh, I'd also, uh, I think I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. Does someone else have a, a story or a moment or a memory? I remember Norm, Duff, Norm Duncan coming to my dad's meat shop, and so uh, it's appropriate that he's going to share. If there's someone else, you don't have to wait until Norm is finished. You can come up here as well at this time. That way we maximize our use of time and we still land this thing at an appropriate moment. So hello, Norm. Hi. Nice to see you. Yeah, I'm, I know the planning is ever hold this up here. Right so, here. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I told you I'm not used to public. Well, I, yeah. Anyway. I knew them since they moved to Rutland. I used to go and hang around their, their butcher shop. In later years, they did a lot of meat cutting for us. And uh, it was kind of a joke between Ernie and uh, Hank to see who would phone them first on their birthday, whether he phoned his uncle or I did. And uh, I tried to beat all of them. And Ernie always told me I could phone them after 4. After 4 a.m. Yeah. Yeah, they were morning people, both of them. Oh, yeah. They were like in that. No, were you a morning person? Sure. <laughs> anything, anything after midnight's the next day, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Norm. Someone else have a, a story, a moment that they'd like to share uh, of Hank and his influence. Maybe maybe it's about his influence on Winfield here. Okay, John and Sharon are going to come up together. Oh, John's going to speak? Okay. Well done. <laughs> Did you tell him he was going to speak and that's how it worked? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, John's my name. This is Sharon. I got to know Hank uh, when Sharon started working for Hank back in 70, 70s. 72, something like that. So 50 years of, of one heck of a guy. And there's lots of stories, but anyway, we, I, him and I have a friend in, in common, and it was always the same. We always said to him all the time, wooden head, wooden shoes, wooden shoes wouldn't listen. <laughs> and Hank was that way. He had his own way, and his song, I would say, is, I, I came, made it my way. That's right. And... There was one time Hank and we, we went to went to Hawaii with a group of us. And him and I, at that time, uh, the plan was to have 35 uh, millimeter cameras with the big lenses. I would get a big lens, he would get a bigger lens. <laughs> Anyways, we, we went over to Hawaii and we each took pictures. And I don't know, about 50 rolls of pictures out of it. But at first we were at a beach and he was up on top taking pictures of us down below and I took pictures of him. Then we went back to the to the hotel and he thought, you know, I should be done with all the film on here. And he went to check it, and, no, nothing. So he took it to a camera shop. Gag went into the back room and he came back. He said, you got no film in there. <laughs> oh, it's handy. Oh, he said, I always put film in there. <laughs> then he started thinking. Gary, <laughs> Gary had my camera and he didn't put film in it. So I got pictures of him taking pictures of us in his empty camera. <laughs> yeah, no, him and I, we, we, Fintry was the greatest time for us. We had about 12 years with our family, uh, Peningas, uh, Youngs, so forth. We learned to ski, Hank loved to ski. And 
even after we we would get back here back in town there was a group of us that in, in the evening we wanted to go skiing and hank had the boat we would stand outside his shop with our skis with the boat hitched up waiting for him to close the shop up so we could go down to ogadaga center to to ski he, he did love that and 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 snorkeling was another thing he loved to do. But uh, Hank was a uh, Lions member. He supported the Lions Club. He, he, he supplied all the, the uh, sides of beef raffle, the turkeys and hams for the bingles we used to have here. He filled his hall right up with, with people. He was a great supporter of, uh, of our community. And Hank, I'm going to miss you and your ways. Just, you know, you're a great a, guy. Great he, guy. He had a sign at work said, "Rule number one: the boss is always right." <laughs> rule number two: look at rule number one. <laughs> Thanks, John and Sharon. Um, and again, uh, Sharon and the team have helped with some more questions that we're going to enjoy afterwards. And I do hope you can come up to the board because there's a great plaque that uh, the, Lions, uh, the Lions Club made. Hendrick Hank Peninga, 1946 to 2023, Winfield Meat Packers. Uh, you mentioned the wooden shoes. My dad would shovel the driveway in the winter in wooden shoes. And I was like, that can't be comfortable. And they say you can tell a Dutchman, but you can't tell him much. So that's also <laughs> true. Uh, our friends here, come on up. You're come over here and you can uh, make sure that these guys can see you. What's your first name? Susan. 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 Yeah. Um, when you're asking the question about how far we go back and I'm thinking, how far did we go back? And it was the year that, that my late husband and I were married, 69, but they were, Hank and Rich were already friends way back. And uh, so I, I'm trying to remember how our alliance happened, but hanging out with those two little snot-nosed kids and white white hair and of course the Anne was not even in the picture that uh, after we didn't see each other we didn't we never ever had a falling out we just didn't you know friendships left and um but prior to that holy man it was like uh john and sharon talking about being ready at the end of the driveway to go well we, our cards pointed out to here, and we waited and waited for Hank to be finished work so we could play Ramoli, and and with the kids and the kids, but we did not play Ramoli with the kids, and, and and we didn't drink. Drinking wasn't a thing. We we sat and drank coffee and laughed and played penny Ramoli and had so much fun. And then our two kids at the time and those two kids ran all over the house. And if you remember this little house up the street. Um, there was a passageway that the kids loved, and the closet went into that, the, yeah, something kind of secret of that that kids love, right? So anyway, we had good times. Rich and his one of his mini bands played here all the time, and I think John and Sharon, wherever they went, they would attend all the time. I mean, we had so much fun. We'd get all dressed up and then walk up the street and come and party party here so it was so fun but i also wanted to say every tuesday my daughter and i would volunteer at the hospital and we would leave ernie every time so it's like chatting with ernie all the time so yeah that was just so cool because we generally chatted about pain but <laughs> it's just sort of that, that alliance you know and when you're talking about the thing and name through the years Everyone knows that name somehow or another, you know, any of the old time call people. When, when I said, oh, no, my friend, hey, I just see that he just started paying the name. Oh, the, 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 the guy said, whatever the car was. It wasn't, oh. wasn't Hank. It was like, oh, 80, or, I think Parisian. He alluded yeah. to the car earlier. But yeah, yeah that was the car because that was Hank. So that's good. Thank you. Anyways, so very fun. Thank you, Susan. We have time for two more. So one, and then if you've been waiting, please make your way to the front. And there will be more times for stories afterwards, just not with the microphone. So your name is, sir. I'm Brian. Brian. Uh, I had the privilege of working with Hank uh, at the, his last shop. And I remember walking in. I was retired. 
I'm looking for something to do. I knew the Beninga name. And I said, oh, this is meat shop. You know, so I went over and I knocked on the door and I walked in and met Hank. And I said, Hank, I think you need a guy like me. He said, well, what the hell would I need a guy like you for? I said, because I know how to break beef. Give me your phone number. It's still on the wall. And I worked with him. My only regret is that I didn't meet Hank a longer time before. That's good. Thanks, Brian. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Jessica. I'm one of uh, Hank's granddaughters. You have to stand over here so they can see oh, you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, guys. <laughs> so as some of you know, we moved to Alberta about 12 years ago. Um, and I just wanted to let everybody know that I have met uh, a countless amount of people in Alberta that know the Peninga name and the Peninga legacy. And uh, yeah. But it lives on for It'll live on forever. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so these could um, these could go on, and we would love for you to go on up. Uh, well, not actually in that way, but uh, there is a basket here. <laughs> we just are we've been in the process of moving my mom, and I stole the basket from her garage. I put it here today, and she goes, "Isn't that my basket?" I'm like, "Yes." What? How do you know these things? <laughs> yes, we stole your basket for the cards. So. If you have a card that you have written uh, to Cheryl, to the family, and uh, you would want to leave that there, um, that would be wonderful. Uh, but even more importantly, as we enjoy some, some food together today, please do uh, you know, pull aside one of the kids, the grandkids, Cheryl, family members, tell them your condolences, tell them your story. It's one of the greatest gifts of moments like these. And uh, before we move into refreshments, I, I did want us to end at a place that Hank and the Peninga family began. Um, Janine, you shared so well. Every morning at 6 a.m., my Oma, their mother, woke up at 3. Well, probably Ruth was probably up already being perfect, Ruth. So we're just assuming that. We're assuming that to be true. But the brothers, and they would go downstairs and have breakfast in an hour of devotions. And I think at dinner time they also had scripture reading. And so... I think what we see this legacy being built off of is a core of faith and integrity that just spills out in a lot of ways. And um, Hank knew Jesus, there's no doubt about it. And over the years, his faith was two things. It was present and it was personal. And so today as we close, I just wanted to encourage us with the reminder that Hank held this close. It's this, the grave is not the end. This is what he believed. This is what he taught. This is what we live. This is what Christmas actually indicates. God came near so that we might find our way home to him. So I'm just going to read one passage of scripture, just six verses from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. And I'm going to share this from a paraphrase of scripture by Eugene Peterson called The Message. It's beautiful. Listen to these words today from the Bible. And regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already dead and buried, we don't want you in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and he broke loose from the grave, God will certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. And then this, we can tell you with complete confidence, we have the master's word on this, that when the master comes again to get us, those of us who are still alive will not get a jump on the dead and leave them behind. In actual fact, they will be ahead of us. The master himself will give the command, Archangel thunder, God's trumpet blast. He'll come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise. They'll go first. And then the rest of us who are still alive at the time will be caught up with them into the clouds to meet the master. Oh, we will be walking on air. And then there will be one huge family reunion with the master. And so reassure one another with these words. One huge family reunion with the master. That 
is what we have to look forward to. It is the hope that Hank staked his life on. Our God is faithful, and he will fulfill all his promises. Would you stand with me as we close with a word of prayer? And then we... Just invite you to bow your heads, and if you're comfortable just closing your eyes, let me just pray as we close our time. Heavenly Father, thank you for promise that the grave is not the end. And thank you for the message of Christmas that you have come near. Thank you for our husband and father and grandfather and friend and uncle. Hank, thank you for the gift that his life has been to us. Thank you for how he tried to live his life. The joy he brought, the love he shared, the smiles and the laughter. I pray for this family, especially that they would be comforted in his absence and they'd be reminded <laughs> that this is not the end. And we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. So what we'd love to do right now is we set up some tables. Uh, there's some food over there. There's some coffee and drinks. Uh, if you can stay around, we'd love you to do that. We'd love you to stick around to meet some people to share. Uh, there's the table of photos up front to come and look at, a place to put your cards. Uh, for Cheryl, Gary, Keith, Leanne, and all of the family, thank you for being here today. Uh, your presence is a gift. Have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks. Bye-bye. You get so good, people. Art, right? Like, come like, up. Oh, right? <laughs> Coming into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Roger Martin, good to see you. Yeah. Well, I'm an old friend of Hank's from okay. way back. My wife used to work for him. Really? Just down the road here? Yeah, my first wife. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he's a well-known man. Yeah. Or yeah. oh, he just loves my mother. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, Germans are the best. Yeah. <laughs> so, I want to meet Cheryl. And Cheryl yeah. is right here. And then uh, the aunt Cheryl. Cheryl is in the pink jacket. And then the Ann is in the black jacket. Yeah. Yeah, Roger. Hey, Mike, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, can good. you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Thank yes. You. It was Thank the you. nicest, nicest event. <laughs> Nicely done. Your, your, Ruth, your eulogy was such a beautiful starting point. <laughs> and Janine did such a good, her expressiveness. I'm telling you. She's fantastic. She did our 25th, yeah. 25 minutes of talking. Yeah. She was amazing. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, been a, it's been a good day. Uh, I'm gonna, do you want to say hi to your kids at all or are you good for now? We're, we're good. We're good. Thanks okay. so much. If you want, I can leave this here and people might come around and talk to you still. Okay. They, who knows? It's fine. Okay. It's fine. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks for I'm doing this so much. Okay. I love you. Thank you. It was an honor, guys. It